I'm Roger Conover, the art and architecture editor at the MIT Press. I've worked with Ai Weiwei on three books over the course of the past seven years, including the one that we are here to celebrate tonight, from which representative images will be looped on the screen as I speak. But I want to say first that Ai Weiwei and I have only met once, and that was literally two minutes ago <laughs> in the front seat here. All prior communication has been by email. Therefore, dear Ai Weiwei, <laughs> the last time you occupied a stage in Boston, you were missing. Your absence was signified by a green military coat on an empty chair. That was April 11, 2011, at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Having, taken, having been taken into custody at the Beijing International Airport on April 3rd, you had been missing for eight days. Less than a month before your detainment, MIT Press had published an English language translation of selections from your weekly blog, a blog that the Chinese government had shut down two years earlier. I think everyone in this room knows at least the rough outlines of the story from there. Solitary confinement, sleep deprivation, the bulldozing of your studio, house arrest, beatings, humiliations, the international outcry from artists and art institutions, and the eventual return of your passport and move to Berlin. But what I doubt anyone in this room remembers is that within a week of your detainment, Madame Liu Yandong, then the highest ranking female member of the Chinese Politburo and vice premier of the People's Republic of China, came to MIT to meet with Susan Hockfield, the then president of MIT, to discuss ways of deepening the exchange of technology, talent, and ideas between MIT and China, and to sign letters of intent for more extensive cooperation and collaboration between MIT and Chinese universities. When I heard that such a powerful member of your country's government was going to be a guest at MIT, I decided that it would be an appropriate gesture to give her a copy of Ai Weiwei's blog. <laughs> in English as a gift, not only as an example of what I consider to be among the very best work that we were doing at the MIT Press, but as a way of letting her know that the intellectual exchange she desired between MIT and China was already alive and well. And perhaps also to make the point that the voice of her country's most important contemporary artist and public intellectual had not been silenced. Ai Weiwei, we didn't know where you were, but your texts were informing the thinking of MIT students and influencing the discourse of American campuses from wherever you might be. I'm sure you can imagine the rest of the story. Security protocols prevented the vice premier from actually receiving the book, but the attempt was made and the point was made. Now, as much as the Western media makes of you as an A-list power artist, as much as you are routinely compared to Andy Warhol, as close as you were to Allen Ginsberg, and as much as you are admired by some of us for being a top-tier blackjack player in the casinos of Atlantic City in the streets of New York in your 20s and 30s, the road from where you were once to where you are now has been riddled with challenges, to say the least. You were born under the five stars of China, and you were one of the original members of the stars art group, but you were not born a star. At age one, you were sent with your family to Northwest China, where your father, Ai Ching, a distinguished poet, spent more than 20 years in re-education, cleaning bathrooms in a forced labor camp. And long before you made the epic film Human Flow about the current refugee crisis, you had been deplaced numerous times from your own places of dwelling. Your acts on behalf of human rights victims and your belief that architecture at its best can redesign a state entails an aesthetics of pain as well as a practice of justice. Being an artist does not always equate with courage or with putting one's personal sovereignty, health, and freedom at risk. Many great artists know very well how to protect themselves. You, Ai Weiwei, do not play it safe. You put it all on the line for your people. Your work is a gift not only to them, but to all people who dream of freedom. Okay. I could go on like that, but let's get to this evening. This event sold out in a day. No empty 
chairs here tonight to drape with green coats. There is thrill and excitement in this hall tonight. We all know how rare a visit like this is and how fortunate we are to share some time with you. There is only so much of it and you only have so much to give. Thank you for the considerable effort I know it took for you to get here. Thanks to your team, especially Jennifer Ng and Daryl Leung and your incredible colleagues at Chambers Fine Art in New York and Beijing who are co-publishing your new book with us, especially the gallery's owner, Chris Mao, who initiated a conversation about this book with me two years ago, and the director, Dan Chen, without whom there would absolutely be no book. Dan Chen, I've also um, never met, but, but hope to uh, before this evening is over. <laughs> if it weren't for our MFA friends, none of us would be here tonight. Matthew Teitelbaum, director of the MFA, warmly embraced this proposal well after the MFA's fall calendar was fixed. None of this would have happened without the precise and gracious expertises of Ketchy, uh, Katie Getchell and Kristen Hoskins. I'm so impressed by the work of both of you. At the MIT Press, this event had and continues to have the unwavering support of Amy Brand, our intrepid director, and of Molly Grote and Kate Silverman Wilson to help offset the book's production cost. We had a generous grant from the Muriel Cooper Fund. I want to thank Nicholas Negroponte, who I believe is also here tonight, who more than anyone else has helped to preserve Muriel Cooper's legacy. And last, but most, I want to thank my colleague Janet Rossi, who coordinated and oversaw every detail of the book's production with a printer in Verona and every last correction with Ai Weiwei's studio in Berlin, miraculously, miraculously managing to get copies here tonight against what seemed like impossible odds even a week ago. Thank you, Janet. Now, a few final words about the book itself, since its publication is why Ai Weiwei is here tonight. Ai Weiwei, Beijing Photographs, is a visual autobiography of a critically formative decade of one artist development containing over 600 photographs taken in Beijing between 1993 and 2003. Ai Weiwei started taking pictures early on and didn't stop the way he would later blog and tweet. He shot the way Warhol did, daily, habitually, compulsively, recording everywhere he went, what he saw, who he was with, first with a camera, then with an iPhone. Stephanie Tung and John Hancock, who also joined us tonight, worked closely with Ai Weiwei to cull these images from an archive of over 40,000 photographs to those finally chosen for the book. As they articulate in their introductions, the book is being the, the book that, that is being launched tonight is not only unique among book works produced by artists, I'm sorry, it's not only unique among book works produced by this artist, it is unique among photo books produced by any artist. I'm sure Ai Weiwei is well aware that, uh, yes, that the empty chairs or the empty chair at the GSD a number of years ago is poetically counterpointed by all of the occupied chairs tonight. I believe it's now time for the conversation between I and Christina Yuyu to begin. Christina is the Museum of Fine Arts Curator of the Art of Asia and a noted scholar of both contemporary and historic Chinese art. So Christina, over to you and please welcome Ai Weiwei. Roger for giving a very generous introduction and also thanks to MIT and Chambers Fine Art for giving this opportunity to us to um, talk about this photo uh, book with Ai Weiwei and also because of this book that we were able to bring Ai Weiwei here with us. So thank you Roger and thank you Ai Weiwei for being here with us today. Thank you. First I really have to thank you, Roger. You may just met uh, 20 minutes ago. He had a talk uh, 17 minutes there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I kind of sense I 
I was going to be detained at that time, so I started to prepare my blog because it was shut down. So when I was in detention, I feel pretty good because they, they're talking about I'm going to be put away for maybe 11 to 13 years or serve sentence. So in my mind, I think uh, pretty good. I prepared my book to be out. So that's the book is so important to me, the, the, my blog book. book. It means uh, quite uh, rough and uh, brutal writing, but uh, still a book serves a very essential purpose to carry the message and to, to express myself uh, in very special time, in very special uh, location. So thank you for Roger again for MIT Prize. So it seems like we should start our conversation about books. And uh, um, let's talk a little bit about this book that we're looking at today and tonight. And as Roger said, it is um, a collection of photos that you took between 1993 and 2003. And he also told us that about 600 photos were selected from more than 40,000 that you've taken in this 10 years time period. So can you talk uh, a little bit about how the idea of the book come about? What's the process of selecting photos? I start taking photos casually um, when I was uh, around the 82, 83, when I just moved to New York. At that time, uh, I have uh, plenty of time, but uh, fields have not much to do. So I think maybe I should record the time. I, th I know even myself not functioning very well in, as an artist, but uh, still I think the time passing is important. You know, the, the, the I should record the time even, you know, I'm not a very functioning well, you know, it's, as, a art, uh, as a young student trying to to be an artist in New York in the 80s is not an easy task. So, but I still um, uh, think back, I, I did uh, maybe about 10,000 photos. That time still, as a, uh, I was very poor, so I don't even print it. I just put the negatives in the refrigerator. <coughs> and uh, till around 93, I moved back to China. So that time I developed uh, uh, those uh, negatives with uh, one assistant. And uh, so that's the first book I published is between 83 to 93. And uh, I, I, I think anybody will be surprised. Even the photo you, you took at the time, you think it serves non-importance, but uh, later the time gave its importance. It gave the weight, gave it to a lot of meaning to those uh, moment. Even, uh, you know, you, so then I realized the photo is not a, the reality, it's parallel to, to our life and it has its own life. So I, so, but I still taking photos between 93 to till now, but uh, this book covers from 90s, uh, uh, to, uh, 1993 to 2003 that 10 years, so I take uh, even more photos, maybe 10 times or, or uh, more photos. And still, that, time, that period of time, if we look back, it's very important because uh, um, that's still an, another 10 years I have nothing to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come back to China, China already become uh, uh, another society. It's not a society I'm familiar with, but uh, a very capitalized society. People uh, trying to become rich and they, they do anything, any, anything possible to, to make a difference. So I feel I'm an outsider. I'm, uh, I'm be in my nation, I become foreigner again. So I, I go to antique market, I go to uh, I start to later to um, publish underground books, 
and uh, made the first uh, gallery space in China to show local artists. It's just uh, trying to find something to do. But, uh, and besides that, I, I took those photos. And uh, till 90, uh, 2004, I had uh, my first art show. So this is right before I have my, I become an artist again. So that, that per period of uh, history um, it looks quite uh, boring because the book doesn't really have an important uh, um, glamorous image in there, but it's very truthful recording of China as a nation, China, that period of time also very important. Because art after 2000, uh, 19, uh, um, you know, uh, 1998, um, 89, you know, after China crashed down the, you know, Tiananmen students. There's a period of time from 89 to about uh, before the Olympics, 2008, China really uh, struggled to try to be accepted by international um, world and also trying to, to establish itself. So, same, uh, seemingly as a quiet period of time, but it really is like a, a time before a storm. So, but my photo, I think, uh, not only record my my surroundings, but also about the time at that time, uh, about China at that time. So, it has some interesting aspect in it. Well, maybe those photos, when you were taking them, they seem mundane, but actually looking back, especially for us, you know, trying to understand you as an artist, as an activist, and understanding what was happening in China at the time, it was actually quite meaningful. I think you covered so many grounds, so we will slow you down a little bit and dive into some of the details, okay? Um, so let's look at this first image. First, so first of all, can you tell me who are in the photos? It's um, well, the one on the left or on my left is my father. Uh, I, the younger one is me. <laughs> <laughs> I, now I look like the older one, but <laughs> actually, the older one passed away on 1996, three years after I. Uh, went back to China, and that's the uh, only excuse I can have to to go back because I promised myself I will never go back. And uh, but uh, I, you know, I changed my mind. You know, I, that's why I don't trust myself so much. <laughs> and at the end of his life, I said, "Okay, this is the last excuse I can, you know, to to go back." So. I went back, he's in hospital. This is, uh, I often go to hospital to see him. He recognized me, but uh, not much uh, communication. And uh, I remember one sentence he told me, he said, um, you, this is your home, you shouldn't be live here like a guest. Just be yourself and do whatever you think uh, you like to do. I always remember this, especially when he passed away. And I, I think that's the last uh, uh, meaningful sentence they told me to, to be yourself and to, to take the consequence of be yourself. So very often uh, we're not act that way. So that's my father and uh, he, he's a poet. He's, uh, he studied in Paris and in the 1930s. Then right after he came back to China, he was sentenced for years. So during his uh, spending time in jail, he became a poet because in, in, in the jail he cannot pen. And he became a very well-known poet, maybe the uh, most uh, well-known poet in China. And uh, yeah, this is a photo of us, one of the last photos. So. Something's very touching about this photo for me is that there's a detail that your hand is on top of your father's hand. And I know in traditional Chinese culture, it's not very common for family members to express your feelings by touching each other. 
you're very sensitive. I never touch my father. And uh, this is uh, a moment he sensed that the move that, that much. So I put my hands on his skin. It's, it's kind of, you can feel the temperature is very, a little bit cold. And, uh, you know, the skin is already old man's skin. Is, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably a maximum for a Chinese to show their affections. Uh, it's true, you know. <laughs> yeah. So after you moved away, while you are reconnecting with your family, especially your father, you are also playing a very important role in the um, very small but close um, community of artists active in Beijing at the time. So um, here are some photos uh, that you took or somebody took of you of artists' gatherings. And uh, can you um, tell us how the gatherings were taking place, what was your role with this community, and what you were trying to accomplish or achieve by getting together and doing gatherings, talks, and exhibitions? The photo on, on my side is uh, probably first Chinese art show. It's only showed in my, my living room because there's no galleries in Sempoli in China. There's only some art space in foreigners' uh, hotel or diplomat compound, you know, some, somebody's apartment. So I live in a um, um, uh, like, uh, ordinary uh, neighborhood. So uh, artists I know said I want to have a show. Uh, I said, you can show in my apartment. So this is my apartment. And uh, we invite all the people in Beijing who, who may care about art. That, that's amount of them, you know, it's not ma 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 many. But those people now become quite uh, well known. There's uh, Fan Dia, who is uh, uh, head of a central um, art. Uh, uh, art University, there's Xu Bing sitting there, and uh, you know, this uh, and the one sit far away is uh, Wei Jingsheng, who is uh, maybe number one political prisoner just been released. You know, it's a group of people among the early movement of Chinese contemporary art, they call the Star Group. And uh, the next photo is I'm uh, part of this uh, art um, and uh, performance practice among the few uh, performance artists, Zhang Huan, Ma Liu Ming, and uh, uh, Cang Xing, those, those artists, uh, they are in a little village called uh, East Village, later being destroyed by local police. So, so you see my activities uh, are quite associated with uh, those uh, those people. So at that time, a lot of artists were really looking up to you. You're somebody who just came back uh, from China, brought a lot of ideas and exposures to Western art. And you also published very important books, sometimes even like manifestos, including the black, white, and gray three volumes. So was there a sense of mission that you were gathering together to do something to change what was happening in China at the time? Um, probably I was only one artist stayed in the United States for 12 years. And uh, I also, you know, and I, I know very deeply about what contemporary practice in, in New York. And uh, I basically went to all the museum shows and galleries. So the people, when they see me um, come back from New York, they think I'm a living Buddha. You know, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, they, they really gathered uh, around me and uh, always ask me questions, how we become an uh, artist or how we can catch attention or, you know, what to make artists successful. And uh, uh, certainly I'm not in the position to tell them because I'm such a failure. But still, they, they, they don't believe me. They think uh, I, I, I did everything, has some kind of purpose there. So, but one thing I, I trying to emphasize to, to the 
people in there, I said, you should respect your own life and really uh, reflect your own um, condition. Because uh, if we think about the Western artists, doesn't matter how strong they are, they can never imagine or create a condition as, uh, as your condition is very valuable, you know, even it's very difficult. So many artists uh, did the works uh, which in that direction, like Zhang Huan did the early works hanging himself uh, in, under a ceiling, let blood come out. But uh, the photo is not here. And uh, also he did another work uh, sitting in a public toilet, which is very, uh, very dirty and very messy condition. So that uh, gave a local artist uh, maybe a new idea to to respect their own life and uh, to pay much more uh, attention rather than think about uh, how West would uh, look at them. So you kept saying that you were not doing a lot, you were not achieving a lot, um, but you are doing something here in this series of photos. So can you tell us what is going on? Yeah, photos are really like uh, evidence for a crime. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I cannot yeah. even deny, you know, this is a, a photo I, I hammered uh, Imperial uh, Qing Dynasty porcelain. Um, I just smashed it, you know. Right, and, and we're uh, talking about it in a museum context. <laughs> my brother is uh, my brother. My brother is a collector. He has a very uh, superior eye to to pick up beautiful objects, and uh, I have this kind of attitude. Sometimes I get bored. Also, I want to do something which which really would uh, against myself. You know. I feel pain when I, my hammer comes down, you know, but it just, it's before I realize it's already smashed, so. And uh, yeah, I, we took this photo. Actually, to achieve this photo, we, we took a, uh, it was smashed a few of them, because <laughs> it's but not it easy to I take thought. a photo like this, but yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> so nowadays when you go to museums like what we did today, for example, looking through our galleries and looking at the beautiful antiques in, in the galleries, do you still have the impulse? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not even impulse, a plan. <laughs> no, I become another person. You know, I, I totally changed my behavior several times already. <laughs> You know, I am I'm, I'm very good about myself. Is I know how to self-educate myself, learning from my mistakes, and uh, yeah, this is be a part of a civilized society. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I understand is that actually why don't you just uh, change it to another photo? <laughs> it's really well, we can, disturbing. We can come back to this. <laughs> Another <laughs> very iconic image, but also sometimes gives museum uh, curators a little bit headache of how to display them and explain them. Uh, <laughs> so this is a series called Study of Perspectives. And uh, when did you start this series? And uh, what were you trying to convey in these images? I did those since around 19... 94, five, May, uh, when I just arrived in China. That moment I still, uh, on June, uh, June 4th, I still go to the, you know, Tiananmen Square. And uh, for, for no reason, I just want to go to there with my girlfriend at that time. And uh, every time I thought I have to do something, you know, but what can I do in this more underground uh, p police, undercover police and, and the visitors there, the tourists there. So I took a one, one photo 
I don't think they understand my gesture, but uh, <coughs> but the photo is very solid. Uh, the background is, uh, you know, that's good about photography is it takes such a short time, nobody can even under, no, understand or... So later, I, I took a few more here and there, mostly because I visited somewhere and I see people take selfies about themselves. That time, so, the word selfie does not even exist. So I, I take a, a portrait of my left finger, mid finger, and uh, that becomes some kind of tradition for me. But it's really a childish act, you know, it's really... It's, so I give a good title, Study of a Perspective. It's really when, you know, I think it's uh, really uh, in, in Renaissance time, the, you know, the Da Vinci and all those masters, they, they, they find a perspective about uh, things. And uh, that's, so it has serves a double meaning. So another photo, that one is uh, parking Beijing, I think. Uh, the ne next one is uh, Casino of uh, Taj Mahal. It's, uh, it's Trump's, actually, it's our president's, your president's uh, <laughs> casino. But that time, nobody can ever imagine he will become a president. So I did this very disgraceful act. I f deeply, uh, you know, feel sorry and apologize for that. <laughs> Have you thought of sending him that photo? I don't think he would care. <laughs> okay, so we are growing, we're going a little bit chronologically and following the stories of, um, of this book. So here we are looking at late 1990s. This is when you started to build some large scale studios outside Beijing. And it also seems a time when your works become increasingly more ambitious, both in scale, in its labor intensity, and its message. So, um, and uh, it, it's also a time when you talk about, you know, you started this first ever um, art gallery space um, in China outside Beijing, the, the, the Chinese um, art archive. So, um, I understand that some of these studios now is also destroyed recently, correct? Uh, correct, but it's not, a, it's not a very unique situation. In China, probably um, about at least half of houses uh, built 20, 30 years ago are uh, being destroyed today uh, because of this kind of rough uh, condition. So top two photos really to my first art studio is really uh, this kind of temporary houses, but I'm always in love with this kind of so-called temporary houses. You know, it's very basic, very essential, and uh, and uh, I grew some uh, grass there. As I, I still remember the seeds of, of the grass is uh, imported from a uh, maybe Denmark or somewhere. And uh, it's just in the market, I put uh, those seeds in, uh, but uh, suddenly the seeds grow so fast. I, so I was amazed, that, that's why I took some photos of those grass, because unbelievable. Later I realized this studio is under high voltage lines. <laughs> I, it's really a good place to grow things. <laughs> <laughs> really high voltage lines there. And uh, again, there's some kind of evidence. Then, and the bottom two photos is a studio I built. Uh, it's a very nice studio with good proportion and uh, skylight. It's about uh, $30,000. Uh, to build the whole studio in th uh, 30 days. So, it, it, you know you know about Cao Changdi, right. I built so many buildings there, so since this space, I become an architect, they, they, think, uh, they all think I can build, so. Um, before we talk about uh, architect and architecture, do you think the way you create your artwork, um, how is it connected with your studio practice, because it seems like 
your works are getting, the skills getting bigger and bigger, and, and your studios are getting bigger and bigger as well. Well, it's uh, you know people think the space is big, but but if you see this work on on this corner, it's it's only contains half of the work, but the work is not made of a one day. On every, everything on the ground is. Uh, uh, my collection on the Neolithic uh, stone ox, or um, it's about 3,600 pieces. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit more than what you have in your museum. And uh, it takes a long time, and uh, it's, but that's just uh, half of the work. And uh, without this kind of space, uh, you cannot even display it, so that's just one single work. It seems like this is also around the time when you are producing more artwork, having more interaction with uh, the, the art world outside, and it's also the time when actually from the West perspective that Chinese contemporary art got a lot of attention, exposure. Um, for example, in 1998, there was the first um, exhibition on contemporary Chinese art inside out at Asia Society, and also, of course, Chambers Fine Art um, opened in 1999. So what's the, this relationship between your own art creating while at the same time um, having more and more contacts with either artists or curators or architects where we, that we are seeing here? Um, that time I... Actually, I, I'm interested in collecting or to make certain kind of works which relate to uh, Chinese furniture or carpentry, but I never imagined anybody else would be interested in that. When people talk about Chinese art, they often try to find this Chineseness in there. So my art is not uh, obviously um, can be seen as a Chinese. So I, I never imagined I will um, become an artist in that time, but still I have an interest to in making some objects because I am deeply fascinated by it since I have been collecting and uh, I have been doing collecting uh, for quite some time then. So you also talk, actually early on you touched about that you became an architect and you love doing it. So. What is this in, so we saw that at the same time, you know, you're making more in art, but you're also expanding your repertoire. You, you started to make installation, and then you, I think you also at some time made some music, and uh, now you also uh, um, endeavor into this um, architectural realm. So can you talk a little bit about um, what is so exciting about creating new spaces? I become architects uh, only because when my I, when I moved back to Beijing, I stayed with my my mom in an old court uh, courtyard house. But after I stayed with her about uh, six years, she got really tired. She feel this this you know I'm uh, that that time I'm almost forty years old, but she thinks I'm doing nothing. Yet, yeah, which is true, I should think. <laughs> you know, I come back from the United States, never had, uh, a, you know, U.S. Uh, citizenship, you know, never really graduated from a, a university, which I'm also surprised that why I didn't do it. It's so easy for me. But something to do with my character really has a problem. You know, I can easily graduate from any university. I, know I was a very smart student, but I just don't, I just hate campus, you know, I don't like campus that much. Now I have I changed my view, you know. In campus, a lot of good restaurants and bars and stuff. <laughs> and uh, at that time, I couldn't, just I couldn't. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to drive. I, I, I didn't marry, you know, 40 years old. If a Chinese man not married, some, some kind of problem there. And uh, so one day we had an argument that she said, just move out. I take that seriously. I said, okay, I, you know, yeah, it's time to move out. So I, I went to 
uh, not too far from her because I still want to go back to to see her. So that's next to the airport way. So when the taxi take a gas to airport, they would have empty taxi come back to the city. So I can take that taxi because I don't drive. So I can go to see her. So I found a piece of land, asked the landlord. They said, oh yeah, you can, you can rent it. I said, uh, can I build? She said, it's not legal, but uh, I will not stop you. Which is very, this sentence should be uh, right on Chinese constitution. <laughs> so I said, perfect. I start to build. And I built a, a beautiful house there with, uh, I just said, $300. And uh, no, it's not $300, uh, $30,000. And uh, quickly, and uh, I think it's uh, quite beautiful. It's a minimal uh, type of architecture. I built basically like a drawing, a child would draw a house with one window, one door, and the one road come, you know, leading to that door. And uh, I, I feel totally satisfied. That's my first architecture. And after I built it, that's the moment that China start booming. A lot of foreign architecture, architects to come to China. They want to find some houses, uh, you know, local people build, but all they find is this kind of European Louis or, you know, French or Renaissance times copy. So they are pretty disappointed. So some very good architect come to my house, he said, oh, this guy knows how to build, you know. <laughs> he, he knows how to control his, uh, you know, his language. And uh, I become an uh, architect. So I, I, after the, their encouragement, actually, I think it's really misleading. But I become, I'm, I build about 60 projects to, this is a photo. I worked with uh, Jack and Pierre, uh, a Swiss uh, architect's form. Uh, and uh, we are doing, um, after 2000, we are doing, uh, we won the competition of the national stadium. We work together. For and, the Olympics. Uh, yeah, uh, Olympic uh, Stadium. And uh, yeah, we are working on model, developing a model. But that's the last project among my projects. After that, I decide not to do architecture anymore. So if you really have a project, don't, don't think about me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I already quit. So here you're working with uh, Herzog de Mirren and uh, studying different models for um, the Chinese stadium for the Olympics. But interestingly, even though this is a government uh, state sponsored project, it seems that this is also the time you became increasingly critical of the Chinese government and uh, um, became more vocal as well through either blogs we talked about earlier or other forms of social media. I think two things uh, made my change. First, by 2005, uh, Chinese had a blog, you know, they just come out. That time I was an architect, so they said, you're so well known as an architect. And actually my first show in Foreign Nation is invited by German architecture gallery to show my architecture. So that time nobody know I'm an artist. And, uh, so, so the architecture uh, put me in a very political situation because you always have to deal with the government. You have to think about uh, you know, how to develop, why develop, and a beautiful home, and why, you know. So you always also have to work with uh, rich developers. So you see the society in details and how it functions or why it doesn't function. So I have been thinking those and uh, make a lot of argument. But at the beginning was kind of aesthetic argument. And later I think that all those arguments relate to moral and uh, uh, right or wrong. You know, it's related to philosophy. So I become uh, writing more and more, and um, then I become very critical about uh, all conditions. Another thing is, uh, you know, I I get on internet. 
they invited me to, to open up a blog. That time I never touched the computer. I don't know how to type. They said, no, 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 you, you will learn very fast. So I did learn very fast, and once I learned how to get on, I cannot get off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got deeply involved. I, that's, I ended up in jail, I was beaten, I was, you know, all kinds of things, trying to drag myself out, but it's not really possible. So I still have a bad habit to, to, to on Twitter or Instagram, even. It's, um, it's, I already behave much better, but uh, you know, I still sometimes be on this. Okay, and uh, before we are looking at these photos, they are significantly different from what we've been looking at so far, um, in a way that they lack any identifiable markers. If any of us, without your help, wouldn't know what these photos are telling us about. And I uh, saw somewhere you were quoted saying that in the case with photography, where the original gesture may be unimportant, you can nevertheless make it a fact. So can you just talk a little bit about what photo photography means to you? Do you use it as a documentation? Do you, you know, I think we all saw that he just actually took a picture <laughs> while I was asking this question. So do you think photography as an archive, a way of you making a diary or a fine art? What does photography mean to you? Um, photo is photo itself. It's not anything else. And uh, it's not reality, it's not art, it's a photo. And uh, I, so it has a dignity of being as a photo. You know, you can take it uh, with very fine camera, very, very fine lens, or also you can take it with uh, um, even a blurred photo. I love it, you know, uh, or a photo out of focus, or, you know, it's always show its own reality. And that reality you may never even understand, you know, it's, it takes years to look back to see, okay, you know, a bad photo can become a, a good photo. You know, it, it changes, it has its own life. So you always find uh, something surprising in a photo. So when you were looking through some of the photos that you said you never actually developed, even after you took them, will you have a sense of reliving your life? Um, sometimes, it, even I don't like to look at my past or I don't care about my past that much. And, uh, but uh, still, uh, it's uh, quite ironic. You, you, you walk in circles and uh, the time always bring you back. It's like uh, my memory functions are haunting you in sometimes. So photo uh, functions more or less like uh, the, a memory or a note which, uh, which, which may suddenly wake you up, you know. Wake up to reality? I really encourage you to take some photos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well noted, thank you. Uh, um, okay, um, so we um, will move forward about 25 years and uh, a little bit away from this book and looking at some of the um, newest projects that you are working on. So, um, Rick, if you can help us to show a short video clip, please. Thank you. Being a refugee is much more than a political status. It is the most pervasive kind of cruelty that can be exercised against a human being. You are forcibly robbing this human being of all aspects that would make human life not just tolerable, but meaningful in many ways. The more immune you are to people's suffering, that's very, very dangerous. It's critical for us to maintain this humanity. <laughs> همینطوری داریم میچرخیم 
ولی هیچ کس نیستش که بگه یه راهی رو بخواد به ما نشون بده کجا برم زندگی رو شروع کنم children grow up without any hope, without any prospects for the future, without any sense of them being able to make something out of their lives, then they will become very vulnerable to all sorts of exploitation, including radicalization. <laughs> The officials came here and told them, look, there's no way you're going to get papers to continue. Either you go voluntarily or we arrest you. I respect you. you know, I respect we, we, the, we have to respect the passport you. and I respect you. It's going to be a big challenge to recognize that the world is shrinking and people from different religions, different cultures are going to have to learn to live with each other. So this is a monumental um, documentary film that he made recently um, addressing the global uh, refugee crisis. And uh, you titled it Human Flow. Is there any significance about the title itself? What's the meaning of flow here? Well, we all know what happens in today's world. There's, uh about uh, 60 million, or oh, 70 million, actually, it was not 68 million anymore, 70 million refugees, every individual are being forced out of their home, every two seconds, someone being forced out of their home, either by war or by famine or by all kind of um, danger, they have to escape, they have to give up uh, the location they are, where they, they were born with, or they, they understand the perfect well, but they have to go to some foreign areas, and they're trying to survive, trying to give their children a chance, trying to give uh, their, to protect their elderly uh, parents, and take the most dangerous journey, and that journey leads them to, to nowhere, where often they're being blocked, they're being refused, they're being, colored into very dirty colors and uh, to be insulted and uh, you know it's a it's a journey which can be most painful and dark and uh, and endless but uh, still more people become refugees today that's today's uh, condition so when i make this film i try to give a more global uh, understanding um, about um, the history of refugees uh, in 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 the history or in in our life, if we extend a little bit longer, our parents or grandparents, they are refugees um, at a certain moment or a certain some locations. So this is not a current regional uh, refugee crisis; it's a human human crisis, humanitarian crisis. So I try to give a more honest perspective of the situation. And uh, so this is a recent exhibition. And uh, just, can you just tell us a little bit what we're looking at here, please? Uh, this is, I've I, I never been in this location, actually. We, we set up this exhibition in Denmark. And uh, it's a museum's window. We packed with thousands. Uh, uh, left uh, sleeping ja jacket. Uh, f those jackets we picked up in Lesbos, uh, which is a Greece island, around uh, over 500,000 refugees come to Europe from, uh, through Turkey, landed in Lesbos, and uh, they throw those j 
jacket on the shore. So those are the jacket. It's a very beautiful but also very moving piece. And this is another recent work also related to uh, this series. And for me, this is really another example of you constantly cha challenging yourself, but always remain very grounded and full of um, humanity. So my question for you is, among all the happenings in the world right now, why did you choose the topic of the refugee crisis? I think uh, the journey to survive, to, to find a way to let the humanity, uh, humanity survive or to, to make, um, to escape from danger is human nature. And uh, those people who take, make that kind of choice, I think it's already very courageous and uh, a very powerful act. And uh, you know, since uh, 2015, I had a chance to, to you know, have my passport and leave China. So I, I got deeply involved in with this kind of trying to understand the international politics and uh, and trying to understand our modern. Um, understanding about the human rights and about uh, you know all those issues. That's why in almost most uh, about 30, 20, 30 of my experiences, I always try to uh, put the re restructure or to make new works in relating to um, this new human condition. Thank you. And uh, we have another very short clip about how you make these works. And uh, Rick. By the way, the, the clip's a little bit misleading because the actual making is longer than, than <laughs> what we have to What is the, the material? What? It, it, the, the work is made of bamboo. This is a um, uh, long time uh, design and uh, construction. Uh, in uh, Shandong province, there's a uh, Weifang. It's a place in, uh, since ancient time, they make uh, kites and uh, two-dimensional. So I start to use that to make a uh, three-dimensional and try to transform this um, uh, scale. It's very skillful. Uh, it's very lightest um, material, and but a very durable, very strong material. To, to deal with uh, the topics I am interested in or I'm deeply emotionally involved. So how to transform a language. And uh, I always try to use different materials and different techniques and to leading to what I'm in or interested in or what the current condition is. And also this is a studio in China. Uh, you see the studio is um, I use this studio for past twelve years till maybe two months later being demolished. So this is the last work uh, we made in this studio. So it, the work itself become a refugees, and uh, it's showing in Los Angeles um, uh, Marciano uh, Foundation uh, now. If you happen to go to Los Angeles, and uh, you can see the show. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, I know you are continuing your um, traveling to document different refugee um, centers, 
um, and the groups um, right now, even as we speak. And recently, you traveled to Bang uh, Bangladesh to interview and, f and film uh, Rohingya refugees. Yes, I, for me, it's, just, it's not a, a topic or a choice, it's my life. You know, I share my life with the people I care, and I, I share my feelings uh, and extend to, to my position to have experiences and to try to uh, express my concern. Rohingya refugees are from Myanmar and uh, being right after we f shooting the film, actually, there's about uh, 700,000 people gathered and in in one location, which is a little bit larger than Central Park, so now it's almost over a million refugees there, and I I just want to meet them. I just want to see. You know, it's very simple. It's not I want to make a a great project or I, I want to have some other uh, great mission. I just want to see how one million people being like a tree pulled out from the ground and to have to go to another nation. You know, who are, uh, who are they and how, you know, how they survive in this kind of condition. So I went there with uh, a few friends and a team. And uh, my son, I always try to bring my son, he's about 10 years old and has been many, many locations with me. You know, locations, people always say, oh, you shouldn't bring your son, you shouldn't even bring yourself. Uh, so I said, you know, that's life. And uh, yeah, you learn so much by really facing the condition. You know, then I truly start to understand why Confucius in the 2000 years ago to say, a knowledge that man should uh, not just read a thousand books, but really travel a thousand miles. That time, travel a thousand miles is on the, you know, not even horseback, on donkey's back, you know. So it's very difficult in these mountains. So, but I think that's uh, where true knowledge comes from. You have to be there, you have to move your body to there, and you have to face in the situation. So that's why I, I went there, I obviously say it's for a very selfish, selfish reason, just trying to understand what's going on. And I meet those people, those people I realize is really very kind, very soft type of people. I couldn't find a reason why those people are being um, victimized, you know, why they have to the house has to be burned, the women has to be raped, and all the children has to be killed. But it's a reality, it's a part of our world, it's a reality. We, we all feel very responsible for this kind of thing happening at the same time, the 21st century, you know. We are not supposed to have this kind of thing happening. What? Actually, with with that kind of very <laughs> comment, it's very <laughs> very hard to um, to respond. But um, change your subject. <laughs> I um, <laughs> we have a seven minutes. <laughs> um, slightly related, but change, but also change the subject. Seems to me that a lot of what you do. Your, in your life, art and the life is very blended. There's not a clear line of what is public and what is private. Like while what you're doing this work, you also bring your family and inevitably, I would think they have some impact on your family members and your personal life as well. Yeah, I'm kind of stupid. Sometimes I sit so close to you, I think you're part of my family, which is not true, you know, it's nothing to oh, do you. with me. But uh, you know, I, I always get emotionally involved. I always get deeply involved, and uh, sometimes it's very hard to pull myself out, even. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, um, looking forward to, in addition to what uh, that you're going to continue this um, human flow project, this uh, 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 refugee crisis project. We also heard recently that you are actually planning to move back to the US. So 25 years ago, you made a very conscious decision to move away from US and then move back to China. But now you're thinking of moving back. So 
I know there are a lot of things change both in you and in the society and in both countries, but can you just tell us a little bit more about, you know, what's this decision about and what you see that um, it's attractive for you to move, move back to the U.S.? Uh, first, I, I make stupid decisions, you know. It's not really something attract me. I would do very often, it's just the opposite. You know, it's, uh, I have a hundred reasons not to come back. You know, this seems the reason become more and more daily. But, uh, you know, I'm quite lucky I haven't moved back yet. But, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I make it short. <laughs> Well, um, so this is an image that actually uh, we showed one of your works at the Mega Cities exhibition here at MFA. So I want to end with that note. And now knowing that you are moving back to the US, we really look forward uh, to seeing you more here in this country and especially in Boston. So thank you. Thank you.